Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 189. My name is Ari Ben Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkin, our Father, our King, Lord, we ask that you will uh, give us a fruitful study tonight. Help me to recall the words that I've studied this week. Um, give me a supernatural ability to um, practically apply the words, um, not just in the way I uh, explain them to uh, those who are going to be watching my videos and listening to my podcasts, but ultimate Lord, ultimately, Lord, it is my desire to be able to walk out your words um, in my life as a faithful follower of Yeshua so that I can be pleasing to you, so that I can turn from sin, and so that I can be a witness for your great name. Continue to raise us up as uh, students of the word, as uh, followers after your name, and give us um, uh, give us safety and uh, give us blessing. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory of Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Shalom, shalom. These are the live internet studies. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, and we're um, working our way through a study that I wrote on Matthew chapter 9, verses, uh, I want to say it's 14 through 17. Yes. Uh, it's entitled, Are Judaism and Christianity Incompatible with One Another? And as you can see on your screen, we've been normally reading the Matthew uh, version. This particular passage shows up in two of the other Gospels as well, in Luke and in Mark. And for the latter parts of these studies, I've been turning to the Luke passage because of some more details that show up in the study. So let's read the Luke rendering one more time and work from um, the notes that I have recorded for us. Here's what the uh, uh, passage reads, starting in verse 33 of chapter 5 of Luke. Uh, it reads, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. Verse 34, And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Verse 35, The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Verse 36, he also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old cloth. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. Verse 37, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. And then verse 38 and 39, but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. That's verse 39. Now, as we've discussed in the past, we've, we've um, basically ascertained that there's two primary ways that we can interact with this particular scripture. The two primary ways that we can interact with this particular passage are what's defined as the parable slash allegory or um, homily or midrash or something like that. And that's where we take whatever the details are of the passage, and we give them kind of spiritual meanings that aren't necessarily um, plugged into the text. They're, they're kind of implied by the details. Um, you know, there's some type of an example, a teaching lesson that seems to be underneath the, the, the original words that Jesus spoke. And thus, whenever he uses a parable, we know that there's a greater spiritual truth. And we have license for that because that's what he does. Yeshua himself explains his parables in other places. He'll tell the story, the kingdom of God is like a, and then he'll give like a you know, grain of mustard seed or like a pearl of great price or you know, a man who sowed a field or, or, you know, the 10 virgins and things like that. And he uses elements to actually, um, uh, drive point, a central drive home, a central point. That's the way parables and allegories and things like that work. Spiritual truth is the, is the main meaning that you want to walk away with. And the details aren't always as important because sometimes, um, the one-to-one -one correlation between the main point and the parable don't always match up. That's why sometimes parables are very vague. On the other hand, another way to interact with this particular story is to simply take it at face value, kind of common sense, um, practical uh, uh, aspect, and not try to add any spiritual meaning behind it, any like double meanings behind the words or anything like that. Rather, take what Yeshua said at face value, at practical value, kind of common sense, and then the, the takeaway lesson is that there's kind of a common sense, um, practical aspect to it, kind of the pragmatic approach or whatever. So let's look at both of those. The allegory that's essentially put forth by most Christian commentaries 
and um, church pastors and, and um, book stories, Bible studies, seminarians and things like that. Um, the majority um, perspective that you're going to find from the historic Christian um, perspective is that Jesus message uh, of um, new covenant reality is incompatible with the old message of a works based righteousness a system where you have to do in order to please god you have to be obedient in order to be um righteous before god and uh, uh, assumption uh, um assumptively or um presumptively um the new teachings of jesus are so radically different that the old and the new are essentially incompatible with one another and so the old saying goes out with the old in with the new and so what the allegory perspective presents is what amounts to what theologians refer to as replacement theology even though we they don't like that terminology it's more maybe the the hebraic roots messianic um type groups that are fond of highlighting the aspects of replacement theology or supersessionism maybe you've heard it called that some details of dispensationalism also get pulled into this description of the allegory but essentially, all of the elements are this. The old is out, the new is in includes the Old Testament being replaced by the New Testament, the law of Moses being replaced by the law of Christ, the people of Israel being replaced by the Gentile Christian church, um, the, you know, the Tanakh being replaced by the New Testament, things like that. So the essential takeaway is that Judaism is out, Christianity is in, and they are incompatible with one another because Judaism is a works-based system merit theology it's a righteousness based on doing whereas christianity is a righteousness based on believing or something to that effect those are the kind of the the dichotomic views that are kind of in competition with one another and jesus is bringing this new and therefore the old is incompatible and that's why he uses these supposed um parabolic uh examples of the cloth you know the new piece and the old garment right you can't mix the old and new there and the old wine skin and the new wine right you can't mix the old and new there and the bridegroom and the fast and things like that is the idea that i'm the bridegroom and the wedding is taking place right now and so um the old is just gonna have to set aside you know the old way of fasting during during um uh, weddings and things like that all that's gonna have to go away the new way is now that we're gonna be rejoicing well um, even if we were to take the allegory, right, as accurate, verse 39, as I mentioned last week, throws a monkey wrench into the whole thing because Yeshua says, no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. But if in this allegory, in the analogy, in the parable, if what Yeshua is trying to convey is that the new is superior to the old, right? My new way of doing things, right? It's better than the old work system, Judaism and all that. You know, Christianity is better than Judaism. Well, then suddenly he upsets the entire analogy by saying, no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. That doesn't make any sense according to the allegory that's put forth by most Christian pastors and commentaries. If they're trying to purport that Christianity is the new, and Judaism is the old, then basically Yeshua is saying no one after drinking Judaism desires Christianity, for he says Judaism is good. By the way, the word good there in the Greek could be translated better as well. It goes both ways, either good or better. And in fact, some translations um, put it, the, the ESV puts it here as good, but other translations actually write uh, the old is better. So we can say good slash better. Well, is Jesus trying to say that Judaism is better? Then Christianity is he trying to say the law of Moses is better than the law of Christ? Are the people of Israel better than the Gentile Christian Church? You understand how the analogy is suddenly slipped on its head and 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 really really um, gets wonky if you throw verse thirty nine of Luke, which doesn't show up in Matthew's rendering or in Mark's rendering. Right, the only the, this little element of the story only shows up here in thirty nine. So or in uh, Luke. So that's why. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get a better look at this parable and we're trying to work through um some perhaps better interpretations um let's go back to david stern's um commentary uh and finish out i think we'll finish this uh part of my study tonight and then we'll begin to um uh, unpack this just a little bit more all right so um here's what we have to here's what we can see for by looking at this through the eyes of someone who embraces Jesus but still retains their loyalty to Torah, their faithfulness to God's ways, 
and doesn't see Judaism as a works-based religion like Christianity imagines it to be. I mean, there's, I've had this discussion with um, other people uh, who follow my study, and um, there are just numerous logistical problems with assuming that the Judaism's held to some form of works righteousness, even if we factor in the um, interactions that Jesus has with certain people like the rich young ruler, where he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We will talk about that passage perhaps before this study is through, but we're not going to look at that tonight. Let's pick up David Stern's um, commentary here. He wrote the Complete Jewish Bible, and he's also the author of the Jewish New Testament Commentary. I'll put little screenshots of those on the, um, on the uh, video screen in post-production. Here's what his commentary says. The meaning of the figure, and he's, got, he's centering on the new wine part, right? We've already looked at the, uh, the patch and the garment. The meaning of the figure is that the new wine of messianic living cannot be poured into old religious forms if they remain rigid. Now, let me just pause and interject. If you carefully go back and read through the passage on your own, and be careful to notice the words that are used. And if you're really, really careful, you're going to go look at the original Greek of some of those words. What you're going to find is that actually in the analogy, in all three gospel renderings, Yeshua is not actually trying to throw out the older item, whether it be the garment or whether it be the wineskin. When we're talking about the fasting aspect, you know, the wedding and the wineskins, the wedding and the um the, the bridegroom that part is really kind of spot on when we caught when we're talking about the analogy and the allegory and the um the, the you know the parabolic nature yeshua is indeed the bridegroom and the people of israel are the bride or the people of god if you want to include the gentiles in that and kind of broaden it out a little bit i'm fine with that but we do know and affirm that jesus is that bridegroom who has been promised by god his father and now he's brought into the picture and therefore the anchor to this whole story is the fact that he is now bringing himself into the equation and therefore the time for rejoicing is now and yes he'll leave planet earth and then they'll they'll be persecuted and then it's time, you know you can mourn then because the bridegroom's taken away but you have this rejoicing still in the back of your mind because you know number one the holy spirit has been given in yeshua's place and number two yeshua is going to return again someday so it's not even a total weeping you know um uh sorrow scenario for us christians we know that one day our messiah will return and take us to be with him and then um we'll dwell together as one big family again but the point of the parable here is that if it's the allegory and we start from the bridegroom there then we we've got good ground to work from but it's when we start moving into the allegorical meaning of the patch and the wine that we run into trouble in historic christian um uh, interpretations but recall if you go back and read the story very very carefully you'll see that yeshua actually is trying to keep and preserve the older items the patch is brought into the picture because you want to keep the garment otherwise why would you be patching it why don't you just either give it away throw it away toss it out and buy a new one something like that likewise with the wine and the wine skins yeshua clearly says at the end of um matthew and luke's rendering if you recondition the skins prior to introducing this new wine you'll be able to preserve not only the new wine, but the wineskin as well. Both will be preserved is the way it's described in Matthew and in Luke. Likewise, if we carefully go back and look at the Greek words for new and fresh, sometimes rendered new and new, when we're talking about new wine and new wineskins, there are two Greek words that can carry the nuance of new as in qualitatively new and new as in chronologically new one is new in time like new on the scene and the other carries the idea of new as in refreshed or refurbished or something like that reinvigorated and so it's better to render one of those words as new and the other word as fresh not new and new as in they're both brand new and never before been used by allowing for that nuance of qualitatively new for the other word kainos instead of um, chronologically new, which is naos, we allow for what David Stern's trying to introduce to the discussion. So let's pick up David Stern again. He says, but if the old religious forms become fresh, right, that different Greek word, which is not naos, but it's kainos, then what happens is that they can accommodate Yeshua without having to be discarded. So again, remember, you have to remember, <clears throat> remember, you have to remember, right, how's that for redundancy? You have to recall that the the predominant Christian 
examples that are given in your commentaries and that you're going to pick up if you listen to a sermon are that Jesus is trying to toss out the old and introduce the new using this analogy or this allegory or this parable. And in so doing, he's demonstrating that Judaism is bankrupt at this point in time. It is irreparable. It can't be repaired. It simply needs to be shelved or mothballed or put on back burner status or, you know, fill in the blank with whatever analogy is you're used to hearing. But by doing so and introducing this new religion called Christianity, Jesus essentially frees us, the people of God, from any obligation to following after the law of Moses. Likewise, he's letting us know that we've had it all wrong from the beginning. We've always been approaching God through our religious efforts, our righteousness, our obedience to law, our sacrifices as the people of God and things like that. But really, he's trying to let us know it's not all about all that. You don't need any of all that. Of, of that. What you really need is just faith in Messiah, faith in me, faith in God, love for your God, love for your neighbor, and grace upon grace will be poured out upon you. You know, live your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't live your life by your own, own self-righteous obedience and things like that. So um, what we're beginning to see, though, is in that description, if Judaism is truly the bankrupt religion, right, that, that Christianity describes it as today, then it would be true and it would be necessary if that stereotype were true, it actually would be necessary for that old religious form to be tossed out or Jesus to replace that. If that's really accurate view of the Judaisms of the first century. But what we're going to find is if history will help us along with a better reading of the New Testament, there's simply no way to sustain that stereotypical um perspective of the Judaisms of the first century as this stone-cold religion of works. It just doesn't pan out. Even, again, if you uh, factor in um, the idea that many of the religious people of Jesus' day were very, very faithful and loyal to God's words and Torah, we have to ask the question of motive. Motive. If Judaism has the proper motives, then we can retain Judaism. Remember, and I'll say this, then I'll shut up and keep reading David Stern's commentary. Remember, originally when God gave the uh, instructions to Moses to give to Israel, right? We're talking about the constitution of Israel as a people. The laws of Moses became their very constitution, just like we in the United States, the American people, we have this constitution, right? We have these these laws that govern our very lifestyle and the, the fabric of our society. This was the way the Torah was interacted with and uh, viewed in the life of ancient Israel, and even somewhat today, but you know we live in democ democracy rather than theocracy. But the point I'm trying to emphasize is that we should not be so easy to dismiss the Torah in Yeshua's day because this would leave them vulnerable to what? The constitution of Rome around them? You know, the Greek societies? Was Jesus saying, pitch the law of Moses and start living according to you fill in the blank. There wasn't a New Testament um, body of writings that were collected together just yet, right? It's not like Yeshua um, uh, was assuming that they would just simply live according to the laws of Rome around him, right? Remember, the choices around ancient Israel were basically pagan, pagan, and pagan, right? You know, take your choice. Your flavor of paganism was, was really what was um, uh, the only other options besides living according to the laws of Moses without making it up on your own. Or, you know, live according to the laws of the rabbis, right? I mean, we know that they, they had really, really um, watered down and, and, and perverse interpretations of Torah here and there. So it is unthinkable that Jesus would come to rip out his father's Torah from the equation for that reason that I'm describing right there, right? There's just no other way for the people of God to be expected to live righteously and to have definitions of sin according to God's standards if they're going to toss all of the um, standards that Moses has already laid down for them. That's number one. But number two, God's words are pure, right? Go back and do yourself a favor and read Psalm chapter 119 all over again. It's the longest psalm in the entire book of Psalms. So you can't miss it. And every verse is a kind of statement about God's laws and teachings and instructions and, and, and uh, ways that are good, right? They're righteous. They're pure. Um, why would God give something that's inefficient or deficient or 
uh, uh, incomplete in its in its in its original form, right? It's like you know, it's impugning God to, to say that the law that He gave to Moses couldn't cut the job. For the job that it was described to do, it did its job. It 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 was efficient in uh in its in the job that it was described to do without trying to force it to do something that wasn't described to do right it has its limitations is the point i'm trying to make but they were built in god-given limitations and they were designed that way so that they would take you from step a to step b right it was it was a it was a tool used by god and the holy spirit to bring about a desired result in the people of israel uh but in and of itself it could never bring about a certain result namely uh, eternal salvation or or spiritual righteousness or things like that but that doesn't mean it was deficient uh, god gave uh that which was good to the people of israel and it was to be interpreted the way so having said all that let's go back to david stern so if the old religious forms can become fresh right they can be re um refurbished uh they can uh, strip away all of their error and be brought back to their original forms right so judaism doesn't have to be thrown out altogether right we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. then they can accommodate yeshua and we can end up with a, a messianic judaism david stern continues when kainos is rendered new as in many translations right um then the implication seems to be that judaism cannot uh, seems to be that Judaism cannot possibly be a suitable framework for honoring Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. Only the new wineskin of Gentilized Christianity will work. This is the essential interpretation of the allegorical perspective that's uh, offered by mainstream Christianity, evangelical Christianity today, in most of its forms, not certainly all of the forms, right? You're going to find some who are going to say that um, this is a weak interpretation, and they're and they're going to. That's why I had to offer the, uh, the kind of the common sense. There, there are a lot of Christians that are uncomfortable with replacement theology, and rightfully so. Supersessionism, the idea that Israel has been replaced by Christianity, doesn't sit well for many evangelical Christians who love Israel. And so, uh, some of I, that's why I've been um, kind of um, becoming aware and giving credit to some Christian authors out there who are simply saying, "Let's pitch the the centuries-old allegorical explanation that we've been going with for, for for hundreds of years, where we've been teaching that the old is out and the new is in, and Judaism is the old and Christianity is the new. Let's let's toss that and let's just go back to kind of a safe, neutral interpretation where basically Jesus is saying, "Look, if you take all four elements." The, the wedding that's first element the wine uh, I'm sorry the um the uh, uh, uh the patch and the clothing that's the second element the wine skin that's the third element and the um the new wine and the old wine that's the fourth element right if we use Luke's rendering it's only three elements if you look at Matthew and Mark but it's four if you look at Luke if we take all of them and 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 put them on the table and analyze their um similarities what we end up is a basic structure that reveals that um common sense is the is the main focus of yeshua's um statement so he we start this whole, whole thing off with the wedding feast right and it's an observation from people around them saying hey why are your disciples not fasting right you know blah 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 you know everybody fasts at weddings but then yeshua says well, wait a minute duh um i'm i'm the messiah i'm the bridegroom why would you want to fast when i'm here right rejoice don't fast it's, it's just common sense hey right you know you get it in that interpretation we don't have to insert any allegorical um framework that would talk about uh, old versus new judaism being out christianity being anything right? we just talk about common sense you know use your thinking brain hey i'm the messiah why would you fast and then to make his example stick even uh, more he then introduces three parables that are linked or rooted in the um uh the actual example of the 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 why i'm sorry of the uh, the bridegroom and the bride remember the first thing that's mentioned about the the fasting and the and the wedding that's not a parable that's not allegory that's not that that really happened and so yeshua's trying to say hey if you want to understand why we're doing what we're doing let me give you three parables to just explain the common sense factor right no one introduces these two elements of a cloth together suddenly right new patch old claw old um uh clothing right because if you do then common sense tells you that there's going to be a problem right they're going to rip away from each other when you wash the two together 
Uh, likewise, with new wine and old wine skins, you thrust them in together suddenly, and common sense tells you that there's going to be a problem. Boom, right? The wine skins are going to burst because of fermentation and the stretching and things like that. And likewise, um, everybody already knows common sense tells you that the old wine is better because it's already been aged. So those are all, you know, all three of the, the, the um, parables that follow the live example all lend the support to the common sense factor. And so there's no really, there's really no need to even introduce this, this um, pejorative uh, um, allegory that the Christian church has come up with about Judaism being out and uh, Christianity being in things like that. So David Stern is, um, he's working from the allegory, but he's trying to offer a better way to look at it. He continues, this is a peculiar conclusion, especially if recalled that Yeshua was speaking with his fellow Jews. Right? We have to constantly remind ourselves that Jesus spoke within a worldview that was favorable to Judaism. He wouldn't go around just upsetting the apple cart if it didn't um, require it. Yes, this section is called the old man, the new man, and Messianic Judaism. And, we, and yes, we must affirm that at the core, Yeshua is always cutting to the heart of the issue. Because... The problem with man is his old nature. It's not a problem with God's laws. Remember, they have their limitations, but they're built in by God. Thus, we don't have to impugn them. We don't have to denigrate them. We don't have to look down on God's laws as if they were the ones that, are, that were at fault all the time. Instead, we can recognize the built-in limitations of God's laws and praise them for what they are, holy, righteous, and good, like Paul does in Romans chapter 7. What we then do instead is we recognize that the primary problem with us is our old nature and that a reform needs to take place from the inside out. If the old man can be reformed, then we've got something to work with. If the Spirit of God can change the heart of a man from stone into flesh, then we've got something to work with. And Yeshua knows that, right? He's the wise God. He's, he's God living among us. He's God among men. And so, um, speaking to fellow Jews and just walking around, you know, saying the, you know, Judaism's out, Christianity's in, right? My teachings are in, the law of Moses is out, let's replace everything. Hey, hey, hey. That just wouldn't fly with any Jewish person who is um, seriously worth their, um, their place in Israel. Let's keep reading um, David Stern. Let's finish this paragraph right here and then we'll uh, call it quits tonight. As rendered here, um, David Stern is saying, the point is that the only vessel which can hold the new wine of Messianic life in a Jewish setting is a properly renewed, restored, reconditioned, and refreshed Judaism, such as Messianic Judaism was in the first century and aims to be now. So, we're looking at David Stern's um, different way of interpreting this passage. He's of the impression that Messianic Judaism is a viable option for us to choose. In the, as I'm closing, in the ancient historical Christian way of interpreting these elements of this parable, Judaism is irreparable. It cannot be replaced. It's run its course. It's old. It's worn out. It needs to be replaced by a new way of living. Indeed, Judaism is a bankrupt religion because it is a system of works. It's a merit theolo theology system. It's based on righteousness of, of keeping the commandments of God. And because we as Christians affirm that you cannot work your way into heaven, right? It's not about works, but by grace. By grace, you save through faith. Paul's going to go on to say in Ephesians, not of yourself, uh, not of works as any man should boast, then we in Christianity affirm that it's only through faith that we come into a right relationship with God. And so because Judaism supposedly had their system all backwards by thinking they could earn their salvation by keeping the commandments, then it's necessary for Jesus to rip that old system out at its roots and replace it with a new system of grace in the New Testament and the new covenant way of living, et cetera, et cetera. But, but uh, David Stern saying, no, there are manifold problems with those interpretations of this particular passage, um, but suffice to say, it's not necessary to dis uh, to uh, discard Judaism in order to bring in um, the uh, truth of what Jesus is trying to preach. 
um, Messina Judaism is a viable option. And so let's work from that particular option, from that particular perspective. We'll pick this up again next week, and perhaps we'll finish David Stern's commentary. Um, I don't want to rush it, so I broke off right there with that, leaving that last little section. Uh, but we'll pick this up again next week with Judaism be Christianity, Christianity, are Judaism and Christianity incompatible with one another? These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself, Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, I'm a tour to your congregation, K. Latunvala Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at grafting.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and um, took a look around there as well. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash Tetzay Torah Ministries. If you do hit my website, uh, my YouTube channel there, be sure to uh, take notice that I update the uh, site essentially daily, uploading videos daily. Make sure then to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like. Um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on. And be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles, okay? Just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now, um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in a uh, live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q&A. But if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there. And uh, prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions. And I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of, of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. We've been looking at this section number seven in my commentary, Who or What is the Holy Spirit, revisiting the Holy Spirit passages from paper two. We're not really looking at the passages right now. What we've been engaging in is a kind of an excursus using this commentary from a Christian author by the name of uh, Roberto Pereira. I believe I'm saying his name uh, correctly there. And... Um, you'll see it here in a second when I bring it up on the screen. And what we've been working from is basically a Trinitarian perspective of the Holy Spirit, where we're mining our way through Paul's writings, right? The chief author of the New Testament um, letters. And we're looking at the um, Spirit through the lens of look, just... just um, looking at all the some of the details that Paul left behind for us uh, using this particular gentleman's uh, commentary. So... Let's um, let me read this paragraph here that we left off uh, from last week. It's pretty self-explanatory. I'll read it and then we'll just keep going. This author says, Paul addressing the believers in Rome sums up in in one single verse the triune relationship of the Godhead in the believer's life. You are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. That's Romans 8, verse 9. And remember, not last week, but two weeks ago and the four weeks uh, leading up to two weeks ago. Um, does that make any sense at all? Uh, we did this extended excursus of reading through Romans chapter 8 specifically, because Romans 8 is a concentrated portion of scripture where Paul uses uh, descriptions and the terminology related to the Holy Spirit very, um, uh, very, very uh, pointedly, very um, um, 
in a concentrated manner. He's trying to drive up uh, some some details home, and that's a great place to park out on and meditate on, right? Chew on that particular uh, piece of passage for quite a bit, and that's what that's what we tried to do in those last in those um, weeks leading up to these weeks. So it's no wonder that this author is bringing this passage up again. If you notice, however, um, all three elements of the Godhead are in view. We have God himself or the Spirit of God, right? Remember the word God, Theos in the Greek, or, or what we might say is Elohim or sometimes Yahweh in the Hebrew. Um, this word typically is just explaining or portraying God the Father, even though we don't always have the word the Father in there, just God. But then we have the Spirit, right, by name, Pneuma, um, which can either be referring to God the Father, right, the Spirit of God, or the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, first person or third person. It's a little bit of ambiguity, and it's only developed by context. But then in this particular passage, we have the Messiah's name, right, Christos in the Greek, or uh, Mashiach in the Hebrew, it says the spirit of Christ, who does not belong to Christ. And clearly there's at least two persons there. And if anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ, because we have the spirit of God in the first half, and then we have the spirit of Christ or Christ himself in the second half. And whether you're a Binitarian or a Trinitarian, you have to at least admit that there's more than one um, uh, detail that's being addressed here. And that's, that's really Paul's style. He seamlessly interweaves his understanding of God's presence among us as believers because all three persons are at play. It's not one versus the others. There's not a contest going on. Yes, there's hierarchy in God, right? We recognize that. But we also recognize that Paul was trying to simply um, detail, give details that, as God gave them to him without being too philosophical in his explanations. All of the philosophical explanations aren't bad. But we have to realize that they came later on, you know, hundreds of years later in the um, Gentilized Christian church when they were trying to scratch their head and put their finger on how it is that God can be one yet three yet one. So, um, but in, in, in the New Testament writings, we don't have all those philosophical um, discussions taking place. Paul just simply states things as they are kind of in your face. And if you can't understand it, it's because there's a mystery aspect to it, right? God... God is cloaked in mystery, right? We can't fully understand him, but we can fully accept him, right? We can embrace him. All right, even, in, even if it's in mystery. So this author continues, it is remarkable how Paul puts in a nutshell the impact of God's triune activities on the believer's life. Again, God the Father at work, God the Son at work, God the Holy Spirit at work in the life of a believer, and... Um, God, Christ, and the Spirit work together in the life of those who are in Jesus, is how the, the author puts it. This triune operation means life for the believer, the kind of life resulting from the actions of the triune God. The question is always asked, um, who actually dwells inside of us as believers? We know that there's a transformative um, aspect to our belief in Jesus. It's not just a mental kind of um, affirmation that we believe that Jesus died for our sins, and it's not just something that takes place in our brains. It's actually something that we believe by faith takes place very deep inside of a person, right at the heart level, right at the at the conscious will and 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 um, thought processes and 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 um, decision making um, a portion of a person, right. Um, at the very soul, at the very spirit level, we believe that, you ready for it? God comes to live inside of us. Jesus comes to live inside of us. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. So who lives there? Is it one God or is it three persons? The answer is yes, it is one God. It is three persons. It's not three gods and it's not one person. It's one God, three persons, right? So we're talking about um, discussions of um, Trinity. Uh, this section is entitled um, uh, Exploring the Shema, Discussions on the Issues of Trinity. Let's keep uh, reading this author's commentary. We're going to work our way, just so you know, down through uh, the three are God and Father's Holy Spirit, three distinct persons. We're going to read a good chunk of his commentary. We'll stop when we get to the part where the, the title's in the Greek there. All right, so let's go back up. All right, let's keep reading. This author writes, interestingly enough, Paul's synthesis seems to bring to the reader's mind the same literary structure and organization used in the first eight chapters of the letter 
to the Romans where the theme of salvation and sanctification by faith is discussed. I talked about this a few weeks back when we first started kind of taking a bite out of some of these um, uh, this reader's material, but because of jumping around between this commentary and the Romans 8 mini study, um, we kind of got lost. So I you know, went back and started from the beginning, but now we're ready to pick this part up again. Look at this, the way that Paul writes, and um, if you read through the book of Romans, just as a, by way of example, we can see that if we take the first eight chapters, right? So we use chapter eight as kind of the um, the zenith, the point where Paul brings it, kind of uh, brings his study to a full um, kind of sort of conclusion. Uh, this author notes that there seems to be a clear Trinitarian pattern in the chapters, and we're just looking at Romans, we take one, the judgment of God, the Father, uh, the, the judgment of God the Father on sin in chapters one through chapter three, verse twenty. So that's we have God the Father is in full view, and the judgment on sin that's in the first three chapters. Two, the atoning work of the Son through which God justifies and sanctified, sanctifies occupies. Um, chapter 3, verse 21, and goes all the way through chapter 7, verse 25. So that's a kind of a second middle section that if we were to outline this, we would see this, where it's the work of the Son and redemption and what Jesus has done for us as our Messiah on the on the cross, defeating sin and bringing us into this right relationship with the Father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then three, the freedom and guidance of the Spirit picks up the primary focus of Paul's writing, starting in chapter 8, in verse 1 and moving through the entire chapter of verse 39. So you can take Romans starting in chapter 1 and work your way all the way through Romans chapter 8 and break it down along those Trinitarian themes by having God as the theme in the first three chapters, the Son being the theme in the next four uh, chapters, and then the Holy Spirit being the theme in the final chapter, right? So 1 plus 4 plus uh, 1 I'm sorry, three plus four plus one is eight, right? The eight chapter, sorry. So that's what the author is trying to tell us right now. He goes on to say that there's a similar structure in the letter to the Galatians. The NIV entitles verses three, uh, verse 26 through four, verse seven as, quote, sons of God, and verses five, a one through 15 as freedom in Christ, and then verses five, 16 through 26 as life by the Spirit. So notice we have sons of God, freedom in Christ, life by the Spirit. We have all three elements there once again, um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which corroborates our reasoning that for Paul, God is one, but also three. And the careful Trinitarian is going to have to over and over keep articulating this position to those who would not ex who don't hold to this Trinitarian position. Every day, every week, I interact with non-Trinitarian um, folks by way of either email or YouTube commentaries or things like that, YouTube um, comments. And over and over again, the discussions are always brought forth. Well, if God is Trinity, then what about this verse? And there's verses that show where Jesus is praying to the Father or uh, a favorite one that Trinitarians like to highlight and re re uh, remind me of is where Jesus confesses with his own words, um, uh, uh, the Father is greater than I, right? Um, things like that. And so they try to tell me, well, if Jesus is God, then why would he say that the Father is greater than him? Or who's he praying to in the garden or things like that? And I, I, I just kind of have to scratch my head in amazement that we have to have this kind of discussion over and over again with non-Trinitarian believers, because we Trinitarians are not teaching that there are three gods. And this would be um, uh, a problem if Jesus is God and God is God, and they're two separate beings competing with one another. Um, how could Jesus pray to himself, right, if there's only one God? But if there are two gods, then, hey, I guess that's who Jesus is praying to. But yet, if Jesus says that the Father is greater than me, right, the God, Father is greater than I, then how can he equate himself as God? Well, we have to remember there's a, there's a, a healthy amount of ambiguity and equivocation baked into the English terms God, right? You see the bumper sticker on the car in front of you, it says Jesus is God. I mean, that is loaded with equivocation, loaded with ambiguity, loaded with um, terms that are just um, waiting for uh, an argument to happen, a disagreement to happen. There's just no way you can can understand really what's what's 
trying to what's proper what is properly conveyed by the phrase Jesus is God. It's probably why Jesus didn't go around saying, guess what? I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. It just wouldn't really fly. It, it doesn't really make any sense. The word God is too ambiguous in that in that statement. So as Trinitarians, we 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 are constantly trying to disambiguate. We're trying to unpack the words and terms that we find in the Bible that have been translated over into English so that we can explain that God in his essence is one. And the three persons of the Trinity share in that same essence, that same what we say in the Greek is the usia, right? The, the essence of what God is, is shared across the persons of God, meaning there's only one essence or being. I, last week, I, I used like the analogy of like class or, or um, kind or, you know, um, species or things like that. Try to get it a little more source, more scientific. But um, the idea is that the substance, if we want to say it that way, the substance that God is made of is shared by all three of the persons of God. And that's why we can say that they are all they are very God, because there's only one of these kinds of substance. And here's the kicker. Without getting philosophical, the writers of the New Testament understood by the revelation of God that there was only one true substance i'm i'm using the word substance kind of loosely right because that's not the way the bible really describes it but that's the understanding we can walk away from given the data that we're left to uh, uh interpret the substance that god is made up of is unique to god that's the point that's really dr driven home is you read passages like uh, starting in Isaiah chapter 40 and working your way through the, the next four chapters, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, the five chapters there. God over and over again um, establishes that he is the only and true God who wears the title of creator and savior and redeemer and things like that. And this unique and exclusive language that we find that's rooted in the Old Testament and carried over into the New is designed to help us understand that the definitions and properties of whatever God is made up of are exclusive to God. And therefore, when the writers of the New Testament introduce language that overlaps the eternal word of God with God, at, on one hand, they're introducing a separate person but at the other hand, they're um, grounding the uh, identity of this eternal word of God in the same substance that God himself is composed of, meaning the ingredients that God is made up of are true of the eternal word of God and also true of the spirit of God, leading us to the conclusion that there's only one true God from which three persons uh, can be interacted with. And so... Uh, that doesn't have to be done philosophically. You can just take it at face value. I know it's mysterious, but it's not contradictory. And so that's kind of what the author is also trying to um, express to us. He continues, Ephesians 2.18 reads that, quote, through him we have both, we both have access to the Father by one spirit, right? Through him. Who's the him? The him is Yeshua. Again, this is a, what we might call, some, some um, Trinitarians like to say that these are Trinitarian passages whenever you have mentions of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or the three persons. I don't necessarily use the phrase Trinitarian when I'm reading with these passages, although I wouldn't make a hard break from, uh, from, by distancing myself from that description. Rather, I like to say they're triadic passages because they're introducing at least the three elements or three persons. I say elements, but um, three persons to the Godhead. They're, they're bringing in three factors that we would ordinarily wouldn't always have to interact with. All of the verses in the Bible don't always um, display three persons, right? Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's two. It almost gives us the impression that sometimes God is only one and sometimes God is two. Um, but the fact that we have three is data that we have to contend with. And this is where I think, as I inter as I kind of digress a bit once more, this is where I think my Unitarian or non-Trinitarian brothers and sisters um, are led astray. The Bible, if taken in isolation from passage to passage, if we cherry pick, and I'm not accusing you guys of cherry picking, so don't misunderstand my analogy here, if we don't take the Bible in its in its totality, if we only focus on one section or one passage or one chapter, et cetera, et cetera, then we can be led astray that either God is only one when we're in terms of a numerical identity, or we come to the impression that God is maybe 
too. Like he's a Benetarian. I have a few people interact with me via my YouTube comments that are trying to explain to me that there's God and then there's the Spirit, or there's God and then there's the Son. And there's no three. And then, of course, there are some who just say, no, there's only one God, one God right? He's numerically one in terms, in terms of identity. But um, again, if we take the Bible as in, in, its, in its wholeness, in its fullness, which allows for the progressive revelatory nature of God adding more details as time moves on. I have a, a, a certain brother who's uh, interacting with me um, who says I have like a very easy voice to listen to. And he's fond of reminding me that um, he doesn't believe that the Bible is progressive. He's like, why would you say that the Bible progressed? You know, God isn't progressive. He's always been the same. There's no progressive nature. There's no progressive revelation aspect to God's nature. He's always been the same. Ah, I think you're misunderstanding me, brother. I'm not saying that God's nature is progressive. I'm saying that God's revelation of information to human to human uh, to humans is progressive, right? To mankind, God didn't dump all of the information of who He is and what He's doing to mankind all in one verse or even in one book. Indeed, if you start from the beginning of the book, right in Genesis, and you work your way through the to the end of the book, which is Revelation then you're going to find, you're going to see and witness the progressive nature of God's revelation as it unfolds like a scroll that's being unrolled before your very eyes. You don't see all of the contents until you get all of the scroll unrolled. But all of the contents were already there. It's not like God was writing them. Um, but in history, it does feel like God was writing them. But we have to remember that from God's perspective, because he lives outside of time, the scroll was already written, right? He knew the nature of man before he even created man. He knew that Messiah would be the substitutionary sin offering for a fallen human humanity even before mankind came into the picture because God knows everything. He lacks nothing in knowledge. He knows the end even before the beginning begins, right? That's, that's the, the powerful nature of the God that we're dealing with. And yet for us, the minute he created the, the, the heavens and the earth, then time began ticking, right? Time for us began, right? Because the universe is governed by the, the heavenly bodies that dictate time, right? The sun and the moon, the star, the sun and the moon and the earth revolving and things like that. And the bottom line is that we as humans are stuck in time. We're not outside of space and time. Therefore, for us, the revelation has to be revealed a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, right? A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until we... Uh, have the full picture in front of us. So that's progressive revelation. I like to use the phrase information limitation. Doesn't mean that the information is not existing in God's mind, and it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that it's limited to us as humans. So that's what you have to deal with. Let's keep reading this author's uh, statements because I'm, I'm 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 straying away from what he's uh, has to say. Ephesians two eighteen uh, two eighteen through him through Jesus we both have acts we. Yeah, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. The statement seems to be a clear Pauline premise. Through Christ to the Father by the Spirit. And those uh, prepositions are very, very important. Through Christ to the Father by the Spirit. That's Pauline theology in a nutshell. If you want to just distill it down to its simple form, that's the way Paul thought. That's the way he wrote. Everything is through Messiah to the Father by the Spirit. That's basically Paul uh, theology 101 or Paul through and through. Uh, thus, Paul's evidence for the Trinitarian conception of God could be summarized in three groups of passages. Let's read these three groups of passages um, and then we'll uh, call it quits tonight. First passage. In the first group, an unequivocal Trinitarianism is presented. Unequivocal meaning it's not ambiguous, right? So let's listen to it. For instance, in his blessing found in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul mentions together God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit without making any distinction among the three persons. He simply mentions three. Therefore, it seems reasonable to assert that he perceives them as co-equal. Let me pause and let that sink in for a little bit. Paul mentions three. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, these are the favorite titles that show up in Paul's writings. God is the Greek word theos. The Lord Jesus Christ utilizes the word um, kurios, uh, kurios Jesu Christu, uh, there in, as Lord Jesus Christ, and then um, ta uh, hagiu, uh, the, the Spirit who is 
the spirit of holiness, the Pneuma Hagyu or Hagion, however you want to um, uh, describe it, reading it using the case. The understanding that we're, or the impact of this is that Paul is mentioning God, and yet he mentions three persons without any explanation as to um, hierarchy or power or essence or anything like that. So therefore we assume, we assert that he perceives them as co-equal. That's what the author is trying to highlight. Second group of passages uh, that are unequivocal statements of Trinitarian theology. And the, when I say unequivocal, the non-Trinitarian has to wrestle with the implications of passages where Paul is bringing in these three persons. If God is not Trinity, why would Paul bring in God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit? Why does Paul have to bring in those three? If God is not Trinity, if God is not tripersonal, that's the point I'm trying to highlight. It's one thing to speak of God the Father and then not mentioning anything about else, anyone else. Unitarians and Trinitarians don't have a problem affirming um, the identity of who God the Father is. Likewise, when we bring in discussions of who Jesus is, Unitarians seem to have no problem accepting that Jesus is this glorified man that God created a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? I call Star Wars theology, right? When was Jesus created? Or when was the Word of God created? Or the Logos of God? Or the Wisdom of God? Or whatever identity you want to give this second person. Um, some Unitarians, not all, they say that this person was created long time ago, so far back that it feels like eternity to us, but it's not truly eternity. Like God, it's just a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That's why I call it Star Wars theology, right? But um, either way, um, Unitarians and Trinitarians both agree that this second element, the second um, person, the second uh, uh, um, uh, discussion uh, point is brought into passages, but it doesn't necessarily mean that God is a Trinity. When God, when p people like Paul introduce all three, and he doesn't give any um, furthering uh, explanation, and even when he does, it allows us to realize that the Bible is introducing us to language that is familiarizing us to this narrative that we call Trinity, that God has always been. He's always known that he's Trinity. I mean, God isn't the one who has the identity crisis. It's we, as humans, who are trying to figure out who this God is. So this author says in the second group of passages, Paul presents the Godhead as a trio. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, he talks about one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 6, each person is introduced in sequence with the article the, following a similar pattern used in Ephesians 4, right? In a more indirect reference, the three persons are also mentioned in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. So um, that's why I talk about these as triadic passages and things like that, trio passages where we have group, all, the, 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 all three of them um, being discussed, uh, mentioned, um, put forth uh, in front of us for us to uh, contemplate without having to turn it into some heavy philosophical argument or disagreement. And then finally, this author talks about, and we'll stop here tonight, pick this up again next week. This author talks about in the third group of Pauline texts, the three persons are mentioned together, but without any clear threefold structure. A good example of this pattern can be found in Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Quote, God sent the spirit of his son, uh, right? God sent the spirit of his son. Just seamlessly, God sent the spirit of his son. And we have to ask, is that spirit there the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit? Right? There's a little bit of um, ambiguity there kind of kind of on purpose where Paul's just helping us to say or helping us to see that hey this God is complex he's complex in his unity he's one God but his nature is complex he's tripersonal but there's one God and so Paul just writes that way because he he can't depart from monotheism he can't depart from the the truth of the fact that there's one God Right? He knows this from reading the Old Testament. There is only one God. He cannot insinuate that there's more than one God. That's error. That's fallacy. That's idolatry. Right? There is not three gods or two gods. There's only one God. And yet, he's interacting with us in these ways that give us the 
lead us to the conclusion that he's tripersonal. God sent the spirit of his son. The same happens in Romans 8, uh, 1 and uh, following, uh, and 2 Corinthians uh, 2, 13, and Titus 3, 4 through 6. All right, so those of you who are following along with my study on my YouTube channels, I know you're just going to jump into my comments and, and rip apart everything I said or uh, interact with the author and things like that. Um, feel free to send in your questions and comments. I know that uh, this topic can be highly engaging. For some of you, uh, you're snoring. You've been put to sleep. What can I say? But um, either way, you slice it and dice it. I seem to um, get the impression that... Um, uh, these topics of Trinity are becoming more and more relevant because there seems to be this growing, um, how do I want to describe it? This uh, growing um, almost trend, if I want to use that word, within uh, religious circles to try to attack the Trinity. And it seems to be rather vogue to, to put down the Trinity and to um, kind of throw it under the bus as if it's an invention of Catholic Christianity in the 4th century or something like that. I, I hear that over and over again from non-Trinitarian um, pundits, uh, detractors, uh, uh, people who leave comments on my YouTube channels that try to tell me that, what, what are you, what are you like a, a Catholic puppet? You know, you blind by the papal bull, which is just bull, they tell me. Um, you know, th this is a Catholic Christ Catholic Christian invention, uh, you know, the Trinitarian doctrine, but God has always been just one God or something like that. I'm thinking, good grief, are you even listening to my discussion? So we'll pick this up again next week. I actually, I'm fine with you leaving comments. Just don't, don't write a whole book and paste it into my YouTube comments. Okay, that's not appropriate. Interact with the material, okay? Leave a few comments that I can address and write back and we can go back and forth. But if you're just gonna dump a whole essay into my YouTube video, well then um, that's not really cool, okay? So don't do that. But that'll do it for exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity. Let's turn to our liturgy for tonight. We're almost done. Last week, we read Jeremiah 31, 31. This week, we'll just read one verse as well. We're going to read verse 32 right here uh, from the ESV, and we'll read the Hebrew right there over on the right side of the screen. Jeremiah 31, 32. The prophet says to Israel, this new covenant that we read about in verse 31, it is not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So God promises that he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Obviously, Obviously, if you are a Gentile, if you're not of the house of Judah, if you're not of the house of Israel, how do you participate in the new covenant? Of course, most of you are going to answer and say, well, easy. I place my faith in Jesus. And because he instituted the new covenant, then I become a part. And I would answer, correct. That is right. You are brought into new covenant through your faith in Messiah. Absolutely. Amen. Baruch Hashem. That is exactly how you, as a Gentile, become a participant in the new covenant. You place your faith in Yeshua, and he brings you in to covenant membership and into the kingdom of God. But, remember what we learned in my Roman study. The kingdom of God is a kingdom that God has already set up with Israel. And the new covenant, God says, he declares with Israel and with Judah. So if you are a Gentile and you haven't converted and you do believe in Jesus, then you're brought into the kingdom of God that includes the people of Israel. You become part of this kingdom and you become a participant in this kingdom. I believe that Paul would teach that you get grafted into Israel at the remnant level. You don't get grafted into national Israel and become an Israelite uh, with national Israelite status so that you can call yourself an, a Jew. That's not necessary, nor is it accurate. But you do become a spiritual Israelite, if you want to use that term. You certainly become a child of Abraham. Paul would teach that in, in uh, Galatians chapter uh, 3 and Romans chapter 4. So um, we know that's true. But um, uh, uh, is it Galatians 3 or is it Galatians 4? Yeah, I think it is Galatians 3 and Romans 4. I always get those two mixed up. But the point I'm trying to highlight is that as a Gentile, you are brought into um, a, a connection with Israel 
at that uh, at that peoplehood level. You are brought into the house of Israel, even though you don't have to convert. I do believe you become a spiritual Israelite as a Gentile. What does the Hebrew say on the right side of the page? It says Lo Kabrit Asher. I'm so I'm sorry. Yes, Lo Kabrit Asher Karati et Avotam Biyom Heziki Biyadam Lahutsi Am Meerz Mitzraim Asher Hema He Feiru et Briti Vaanochi Baalti Vam Neum Adonai. And that'll do it for the liturgy from the Tanakh. Let's turn to Galatians 3 and continue reading down through this. And we started in verse um, 10 last week, uh, talking about the works of the law. Now let's pick up in verse 11. Paul says, Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, we just looked at it in my Shema study, right? Verse 11. Let's read that in Greek. Paul says, Hati de en namo Udes de kai utai para totheo de lon hati ha de kaias ek pistios zesatai. And notice that the um, uh, the righteous is the word that we find right. Uh, let's see if I can highlight it. There we go. The de kaias, but the justified is right there. The de kai utai. So. It's you can see that they're they're similar. Dikaiutai, dikaios. It's the same root word, which I've hovered my mouse over. It should show up as Strong's number thirteen forty four uh, and Strong thirteen forty two. You can even hear the numbers that they're related. Anyway, that'll do it for our liturgy for tonight. Let's turn now instead to the short little video, and then right after the video is over, we'll just dismiss in prayer. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. Short questions, short answers by Torah teacher Ariel and E Bible. Copyright Tate's Take Torah Ministries 2015. All rights reserved. Here's our question on the table for tonight. What does the Bible say about what foods we should eat? Are there foods a Christian should avoid? So we're going to be talking about issues related to kosher, and that's why I mentioned the table tonight, right? You guys like that uh, reference? Christians, those striving to be Christ-like and those mature enough to handle the meat of the word, pun intended, I think that they should avoid the items that God told Israel to avoid eating. And we're going to be talking about this issue of what we should and what we shouldn't eat and why I think that we should be keeping kosher. After all, I like to say those Gentiles in Israel who believe in Yeshua Jesus do in fact indeed comprise the remnant since they are grafted in. Read Romans 11, 17 through 24, as well as Ephesians 2, 2 through 22. Thus, the Torah given to Israel belongs and applies to the Gentile Christians who have been grafted in as well. Many in the Gentile church often ask WWJD, what would Jesus do? But in my opinion, why not ask WDJD, what did Jesus do? Make sense? Well, I can tell you, he kept the dietary requirements laid down by his father, as recorded by Moshe, that is Moses, in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. It's plain and simple. There's no dispute that Jesus kept kosher. And since we're on the topic of asking what Jesus did, why not include Peter, Paul, and the rest of the disciples? What did they do? Well, I can tell you. They kept kosher just like their master Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Even after Yeshua ascended to the Father, they still kept kosher. In fact, many Jewish believers in Yeshua were still zealous for the law long after Messiah was resurrected as well. You can read Acts 21, 20 to see that there are myriads, right? Multiple thousands that were keeping kosher or keeping the Torah. So in my opinion, if I'm going to emulate someone by my dietary lifestyle, then I would rather emulate the master and his first century followers uh, than someone I might hear in the pulpit on Sunday morning, for instance, saying that it's okay to eat anything you want to put into your mouth. I'm not trying to slam those people who are preaching on Sunday morning. I'm simply saying if I have a choice between what the Torah says, what the Bible says, and following after Jesus and the disciples versus something I hear today, let's choose Jesus. 
I don't judge my brothers who don't eat like I do, but please don't label me the weak of Romans chapter 14. That term, weak, is most likely referred, referring to those unsaved Jews found fellowshipping with Messianic Jews and Gentiles, but who were still investigating the notion of whether or not Yeshua was the Messiah the others were saying he was. Thus, their undecided faith the Messiah was labeled as weak by Paul. You understand? We'll go back and exegete that during the live study. But I just want to let you know right now that that's probably the best way to understand this term weak when we start reading down through Romans chapter 14. Besides, since Paul wrote that letter and since he labels himself among the strong, uh, if you read Romans 15.1, and since we know he kept kosher his entire life, Read Acts 21, 24, 24, 14 through 16, uh, Acts 25, 8, and 26, 4 and 5. Doesn't that make Messianic Jews the strong ones? Check out my podcasts, which are available on iTunes. You can search for me in the store under the search term Ariel Hanavi. But if you prefer to watch your theology, check out my YouTube channel, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and click the bell for notifications. New content is added weekly or even daily. That'll do it for the video for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Abba, I bless your name and thank you for the uh, study. I thank you for the uh, time that was spent. And I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit has been here. He is faithful to uh, perform that which he promised he will do, which is reminding us of the words of the Master Yeshua. Uh, continue to um, give us a opportunity to not just press into your words and to study, but to be a witness to those around us, to share our um, gospel message, to share the uh, the testimony that we have as believers in Messiah, um, continue to raise us up and, and protect us and um, give us um, give us opportunity to come together as often as we can. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and glory. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.